Destiny's Child, one of the highest selling female R&B groups in the world. They dominated pop culture for the 99s and the 2000s. As fate had it, Destiny would have four children, Beyonce, Kelly, Latoya, and Latavia. Destiny would also have two stepchildren, Michelle and Farah. Four of the children would go on to have successful solo albums with many hits, but two would have a much harder time trying to navigate themselves in a precarious industry, failing to produce albums, and ultimately having only their souls to cling to as they watch their dreams, their possessions, and even their own sanities quickly diminish. Interestingly enough, one was initially a replacement for the other, and throughout the trials and tribulations, one's legacy would be adored by hardcore fans, while the other would be endlessly ridiculed and taunted online by fans, and her legacy reduced to luggage. Literally. You're watching Justified by Jury. And in today's episode, we will detail Farrah's life in the public eye, how colorism may have played a part in her rise to fame, but how her dignity garnered her an immediate fall from fame, and the overall erasure of her legacy by those hell-bent on keeping her right where she fell. If there are any other artists you would like to see me cover in these series, please leave your suggestions in the comments below. Let's get started. Destiny's Child rose to fame in 1997 with the release of their hits No 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 Part 1 and 2 from their self-titled debut album and would be catapulted to superstardom in 1999 with the release of their sophomore album Writings on the Wall which spawned their number one hit Bills 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 which would be accompanied by a stylish music video of the girls in a hair salon as a tribute to Beyonce's mother Tina Knowles who owned a hair salon for many years. At this video shoot, the girls would have several background extras to act as their customers, one of which was a girl known as Destiny Franklin, which was fitting since she was on the set of a Destiny's Child video. Uh, called for the Destiny's Child audition for Bills, Bills, Bills. So it was an actual audition? It was an audition. Got you. Actually, I was Beyonce's friend in the video. So mm. that was the role that I had. I uh, ended up becoming friends with the ladies, like actually being cool with them. But I, you know, I pulled up my bubble eye bands, 420. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and I'm, I'm there to get a sag voucher. So they're like, who is this chick? Like, she's an extra, like pulling up in better cars than we have, okay. you know, like. And I wanted to like show them LA, show them my city, you know, mm -hmm. and so. We changed, exchanged our phone numbers, and the next day they actually asked me to come back, and I wasn't working. Mm. So they're like, what if we get you paid your same price to come back? I'm like, I will be here tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> why, why wouldn't I want that? Hello. The video would premiere on June 13th, 1999. Now the number 13 would be an ironic number for the set of events to come for this particular background extra, who just so happened to be in a girl group of her own named Jane Doe, which had aspirations to reach the heights that Destiny's Child had already reached. At this point, Destiny's Child had put in close to a decade of hard work, and though their success was starting to pay off, it came with more issues on the back end as management became more demanding of the girls with little payout financially. In my previous video, The Triumph of LaToya Luckett, I detailed the multitude of transgressions and turmoil that both Latoya and Latavia endured at this time in their lives. Frustrated with how they were being treated, they secretly sought out legal counsel to disaffirm their management agreement with their manager, who happened to be Beyonce's domineering father, Matthew Knowles. He seemed to only show interest in the development of his own daughter and at the expense of other members. Prior to him becoming their manager, all of the girls had two other managers, and Latoya and Latavia sought to get some sense of normalcy back into their routine without being under Matthew's tutelage. So on December 13th, 1999, Destiny's Child would have their last performance before LaToya and LaTavia had an interim attorney send letters to Columbia Records, effectively ending their management agreement with Matthew. Little did they know just how much dominion Matthew had over the Destiny's Child name. He had secretly acquired the trademark for Destiny's Child behind everyone's back. So anything with the DC name on it he owns and is the sole owner 
for now and forever. He would have a rep contact their attorney and tell them that all Destiny's Child shows were canceled until they get the matter resolved. But he quietly ordered Kelly and Beyonce to continue their performances as a duo for the remainder of December and well into January. After enough shows had been completed without LaToya and Latavia, he went above Columbia and straight to their parent company, Sony Music, and informed them that LaToya and LaTavia had failed to fulfill their contractual obligations by not showing up for the shows, causing Sony to promptly terminate them from the act, freeing up space for the group to find two new members to temporarily replace them and tie Destiny's Child over to fulfill the rest of their obligations for the year 2000. The next plan was to snag a solo deal for Beyonce, who was the breakout star. But such wouldn't be the case at least not for a few years. During this time, the team was scouring looking for members who had a similar look and build to the former members, so as not to detract from the group's overall image. Right off the bat, Matthew remembered the pretty girl named Destiny and knew she was in a group of her own, so he had a rep reach out to her and offer her double what she was making to join the group, as Destiny was holding down three jobs at this point and was already making a decent amount of money. But out of her loyalty to Jane Doe, Destiny refused. But she did offer a few talented singers she thought might make a great addition to Destiny's Child. In the meantime, one of Destiny's Child's good friends and label mates, R&B singer Monica, had recommended one of her background singers named Tanitra, who had a soulful voice and similar tall and slender stature that LaToya had. Yeah, I was nervous, very nervous. I hadn't danced. And I took dance. I went to a creative and performing arts high school. But when it came time to dance, I chose to sell the tickets for the show. <laughs> so Houston, I learned the routine for Say My Name. And I went home to Rockford, Illinois, and I got, you know, I had a long length mirror and I would rehearse in my grandmother's bedroom. They would audition her and she would get the part. But after scouring, searching for a member to replace Latavia, Matthew had become insistent on getting Destiny in the group. He had already envisioned their image together and wasn't going to stop applying pressure until he got what he wanted. Eventually, one of the members of Jane Doe became pregnant, putting the group's stint on hold. At the encouragement of her bandmates, Destiny would depart from the group and officially join Destiny's Child, replacing Latavia. Upon joining the group, the new girls had to immediately adhere to Latoya and Latavia's image. Because Latavia was a redhead at the time, Destiny was informed by Tina Knowles, who was the group's stylist, that she would have to dye her hair red and change her name because having the name Destiny in Destiny's Child wasn't fair to the other members, so she went by her government name, Farah. Moreover, Tanitra would have to change her name for the same reason that Calendria had to shorten her name to Kelly, for the comfort of others and because of marketing, so she went by her middle name, Michelle. Yeah, why why didn't she never use Tanitra? I was told it was too... Too ghetto? Too the only member with their original name was, of course, Beyonce, who had made it her own by this point. Unfortunately, the others weren't granted the same opportunity to turn their name into a household name. As the group became more famous, the strategy and marketing became less Afrocentric in more ways than one. Latoya and Latavia were both brown-skinned beauties with ethnic names. However, Farah and Michelle were noticeably lighter, but were told to tan often so that the differences weren't too obvious. But I mean, I did have to tan a lot. When I tan a lot? Because they wanted Beyonce to be the lightest one? I mean, mm. Michelle, I, and Kelly tanned sometimes, <laughs> so... Mm. Wow. And Beyonce wouldn't tan? Not unless we're at a beach. Wow. <laughs> and then that sunscreen would be 45. <laughs> I don't know. Now, it was no secret that with the original lineup, Beyonce was the fairest member in terms of skin shade. But if the intention was to keep it this way, why not just get other brown skin beauties to fulfill the roles of the former members? I'm certain there were many who could dance and sing and would have been excellent additions to the group. But Matthew understood the power of marketing and knew that lighter-skinned women were favored more in mainstream media. This had been happening for years, where a darker-skinned man or woman would be replaced with people of lighter complexion, or where someone significantly lighter and more Eurocentric would portray a more Afrocentric person 
and simply just get a tan or in Zoe Saldana's case, get a prosthetic nose to emulate someone more Afrocentric. All as a tactic to appeal to more audiences whose mainstream medias were fixated on a more Eurocentric standard of beauty. Matthew said for years, Destiny's Child would study all the great black acts that came before them and would incorporate all the tactics that these acts used to ensure success. One of these tactics was crossover appeal. So in his mind, it was more profitable to have a predominantly lighter group than a predominantly darker group. As long as they kept Kelly, they had enough dark skin representation to get by so long as the lighter girls didn't detract from Beyonce. And because when I got to, to Sony as a manager and executive, I was asked to manage an all-girl group that was white, uh, an all-boy group that was white. So I noticed for a fact that their budgets were different, uh, their recording budgets were different, their marketing budgets were different, their advances were different than those in the urban division. Uh, and so that was a discriminatory part of the industry that I witnessed. And, and from a colorism perspective, show me at pop radio the number of black women that were of high complexion and the number of black women that were of dark complexion that got airplay. And when you look back at the charts, at Top 40 Radio, you'll see that the, the black women that have been uh, successful with airplay were all of light complexion. Either way it went, Matthew had the new image he wanted and new women to control since he couldn't exert his dominion over Latoya and Latavia any longer. On February 13th, the new members would officially sign him as their manager. To celebrate the new addition, Matthew invited Farah back to his hotel room to congratulate her. And this is where things would get a bit awkward. He invited me over to the hotel to meet and speak with him. Did Matthew try to sleep with you, Farrah? Um, I haven't met too many people in my life who haven't liked me. I'll just put it like that. <laughs> he didn't try to R. Kelly, you did it. I'll, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> no. no. No, he didn't try to pee on me. <laughs> okay. It's eerie to note that Farah could easily pass for Creole, which is an ethnic background blended of European, Spanish, and African descent, in which Tina Knowles and her family are descended from. And Tina's Creole, I guess? Yes. yes. Okay. She's Creole, but well, her family literally, uh, her great grandparents are white Frenchmen that live right outside of Paris. Aha, uh -huh. okay, and then her... Because Beyonce is her maiden name. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, so you end up, based on the history and everything you've been taught and so forth, and everything you've been exposed to, you go and consciously or unconsciously marry someone much lighter, much lighter than yourself. Exactly. Okay. Th that's exactly right. It does beg the question as to why Matthew was so persistent on her specifically joining the group. He was asked in a 2001 article about Farah, in which he replied, imaging, plain and simple, as his reasoning for recruiting her. Matthew's intentions with this new group was total dominion and control over what he saw as his cash cow. But this control and incessant greed was present in multiple facets including sensuality. But when Farah made it apparent that she wasn't down with any innuendos, she became a potential threat to his ego. As the new group was trying to find its footing, the new girls had approximately two weeks of artist development to try and learn what the old members had been doing for almost 10 years. The video shoot for Say My Name would take place during this time, and the new girls hadn't quite mastered the art of dancing in heels. So they would stop and pose with each frame and the dance moves will become iconic in time. There was just one major hurdle the group would have to get through, and that was the big reveal. At this point, Latavia and Latoya had been at home anxiously awaiting the callback for when the next Destiny's Child show was, when instead they would get a call from someone who was at the Say My Name video shoot saying that they had been replaced. They called B and Kelly to inquire about this, but the girls had changed their phone numbers. It would only be a few days before DC would announce to the world the premiere of the Say My Name video, and that's when everything came tumbling down. Latoya and Latavia would not only find out that they had been replaced, 
but also that Sony had dropped them from the label altogether, which prompted the girls to file a lawsuit against Matthew, Columbia Records, Sony, and Beyonce and Kelly the following month. A little known fact is that the lawsuit also included Farrah and Michelle. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Latoya and Latavia said, since y'all want to defile our names and fire and embarrass us publicly and everyone listed here is a willing participant, then we gonna file this lawsuit and everybody getting it, er everybody getting it. According to Latavia, in a June 2000 Sister to Sister article, she exclaimed that she was fuming after having seen Farrah perform on the Jay Leno show the day before wearing a dress that Latavia herself bought in the mall with her own money. Apparently, many of the clothes that they bought while touring with the group stayed with the group even after they were let go. This is why it was important to find two members who were the same shape and size as Latoya and Latavia. This cut down on budget costs as the girls would often wear the former members old costumes on stage as well. But embarrassing headlines and lawsuits aside, the new group struggled to find their new sound together. Latoya was the soprano singer, so they originally had Michelle as soprano and Farah somewhere on the harmonies. You try for land, good but nothing type of brother. Oh silly me, why haven't I found another? After realizing that this blend clearly wasn't working, they decided that Michelle sounded better on the low notes, like how Latavia did in the original lineup, and that though Farrah could hold a tune on her own, when it came time for harmonization, she fell flat. So they told her to just mime the words and focus on her strong suit, which was dancing. And I'll admit, she ate those girls up on the dance floor every time. Like when it came to dancing, Farrah had that. However, her contribution through dancing did very little for her, as Destiny's Child were not known for their dancing. Sure, they incorporated a lot of intermediate moves into their performances, much like many entertainers and groups in the Y2K era, but unlike Sierra, Justin Timberlake, Usher, and Maya, who are known for their dancing, dancing wasn't necessarily something of notoriety within Destiny's Child. Destiny's Child was known for two things, Beyonce, and the drama surrounding the lineup changes. But with this new plan, and with the group singing all of their old hits, which mostly featured Beyonce anyways, they decided it was best to stick to what worked best. As long as it was Beyonce and Kelly doing the singing, um, the belief of all of us is that it would make a major difference, and sure enough, it didn't. However, teenage Beyonce started to become a bit agitated with the way things were shaping up. She knew in her heart of hearts that she was a solo singer who had matured so much vocally. One could only imagine just how stagnant she must have felt having to tote two new singers who weren't used to performing after her and Kelly had many years of vigorous training. That coupled with the anguish that she felt from the betrayal of the former members relinquishing her father as their manager led to her having little patience at times. Kelly and Beyonce and I became friends and when push came to shove I was able to sing and dance and uh, God just put me in the right place at the right time. That's fake. <laughs> the joker, right? The, the... I saw Latavia in the mall one day, but I mean... Let's cut that over. Don't say that now. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're right. Thanks. If I were queen for a day, everything would be free. Everything would be free? You'd get kicked, kicked out. out. <laughs> But it wasn't Michelle that left the band, it was Farah who was feeling the pressures of a showbiz lifestyle. A viral video has been going around of the girls performing Say My Name and Beyonce chanting Say Beyonce four times at the end of the song. Where she could have said all four of the girls' names, the same way she did when they performed Say My Name with Latoya and Latavia back in 99 which ironically was the first and last time the original lineup performed that song together. As you can see, Beyonce was clearly over this Destiny's Child 2.0. 
but you couldn't just up and abandon ship because of all the obligations that Destiny's Child had to fulfill, not to mention the money they had to get out there and earn back for Columbia Records after the advancement they had received. Farrah mentioned that the grueling schedule, management's demands, backlashes from former members, and the overall pressure of still having to show up and show out and remain grateful for the opportunity really took a toll on her and Michelle as well, even putting Michelle into a bit of a depression. They spent the most time together, as contrary to popular belief, they wouldn't spend leisure time with Kelly or Beyonce once the camera stopped rolling. As a matter of fact, Farrah said there was never a time where it was all four members in a room together by themselves, having a girl chat and catching up. She said B and Kelly were their stars, and her and Michelle were basically their students. They would put on the sisterhood image for show, but that was it. So her and Michelle would bond over a lot and share many secrets and any deep-rooted insecurities they were battling with each other. However, Farrah said that Michelle would change her energy once she was around the rest of the group and management, which I can understand. I mean, you gotta put on a brave face like with any job. Yet Farrah wasn't here for the dog and pony show. What she said behind closed doors would be whatever she said to you face to face. However, there is a time and place for everything. Best opportunity is we get to meet people like Diana Ross and we did Divas Live on VH1. And you have to watch what you do and have fans and it's the best thing. I mean, it overcomes everything. Oh, don't do it. Yeah, yeah. Back to the poll questions. First poll question is, what do women in LA prefer to wear? Bikinis, bloomers, thongs, or nothing at all? Hey, Stop. And I'm from LA, so. Oh, oh girl, I'm Miss Nasty. Let me holler at you. <laughs> no, Excuse no, me. Can I just can I just ease on up in here real quick? I don't want to get messed up nobody's makeup or nothing. You know, I got little hips and whatnot and everything. Uh -oh. Okay, so we used to talking about thongs, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, okay, thongs. Uh, what are you? Oh. Thongs? <laughs> you, oh, you bloomers, huh? Bloomer. <laughs> oh, the no, little innocent one. Hey, innocent. That's a little personal. Can we chat? Oh, what no, don't be mad. what we wear? Yeah, I mean, we did, the poll question was, you know, what the ladies in LA? In LA. What Women in LA. Okay. Right. I mean, but we can find out what y'all wear, too, while you playing. Uh, you did. What kind you wear? Okay. One of the things that it became apparent that Farrah was lacking in was media control. She would often blurt out the first thing that came to mind without carefully thinking through how it might affect the group. As a celebrity, back in the 90s and 2000s, it was expected for you to maintain a level of poise and mystique about yourself. Farrah, on the other hand, was unapologetic and let everything hang out. And while the other members were calculated and maintained bearing at all times, Farrah wanted to blow off steam and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Shell approached you and said, listen, I, I don't want to cause any problems, but Farrah is sneaking out at night and going to the club and she's doing that over and over again. Uh, so she basically snitched on Farrah. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a way. Well, I think she looked at the bigger picture of what was best for the group, uh, which all, you know, that they had always had this team approach to success, that no one of them was stronger than any, uh, than a team, than a group. Uh, and, and I admire what she did. I don't consider it a snitch, because had she, had she not revealed that, we probably believe wouldn't be sitting here talking about Destiny's Child. Farah would appear with her friend Tariq Nasheed on the cover of his book, The Art of Mackin, which was a guide on how to put the Mackin down to bag any shorty you wanted during that time. Even though the photos were taken a year prior to her actually joining the group, at the time she was just trying to get her face out there and not thinking of long-term effects, management was unhappy because it went against the strong and independent image the group was going for. Not to mention, they were trying to keep a decent profile with all of the negative press that they were already receiving. But Farrah's personal life was taking a bit of a hit as well. As the eldest of seven kids, she had been working since the age of 12 and was the breadwinner for her family. Though she was able to send some money back home, she had obligations she had to take care of back home. Unfortunately, Destiny's Child only had three to four days off per month and they weren't consecutive. So the girls were putting a crap ton of work in with very little time to sleep or recover. Nowadays, there are working laws in place to prevent this. 
but Farah had to learn how to prioritize and set schedules that allowed for room of flexibility since she had very little downtime to begin with. But when Destiny's Child were doing their all access tour, Farah had home life obligations to tend to, so she booked a flight for her one day off to fly back home. However, Matthew demanded excess filming time to show the girls in the studio recording the remix to Jumpin' Jumpin', which had already been pre-recorded, mind you. But they wanted to get shots to make viewers feel like they were there in the studio with the girls during the recording process. However, the recording time went over, and Farrah had no time to head back to the hotel and get her things before her flight. The last flight out of here? Yes, ma'am. You might have to go straight to the airport. Okay. I don't I'm have no luggage. I'm, I'm rolling. Well, it's better for you to go home than not have luggage. No, it's not. It's not. Cause I, where y'all coming out there? Well, somebody can send your luggage. But then I'm gonna have to wait for four days before I get all my stuff. That's it. Well, it's either that or you are gonna probably miss your flight. We have nothing against her, but we just felt like we can continue on as a trio. This interaction has since gone viral amongst Destiny's Child fans and social media users alike, since it was shown in a way that made it look as though Beyonce was in so many words kicking Farrah out the group by telling her to go home. But in reality, she was telling Farrah that it was better to be home than to be without luggage, because at home, you at least have clothes and toiletries present with you. Somebody can send your luggage to you. The only problem with this is that she only had one day off, and by the time her luggage would arrive at her house, it would be days later and Destiny's Child would be off somewhere doing a show in a different part of the world. So while I sympathize with Farrah's predicament, she had to understand that the DC camp didn't care about the welfare of what the members decided to do in their downtime. As a celebrity, you are expected to make adjustments off of their ever-changing schedule, not the other way around. This infraction, however, was not Farrah getting kicked out of the group, though her departure would eventually come just a week later. When she claimed of getting the stomach flu while the group was in London, she had to fly home and things didn't go over well. The hospital yesterday of dehydration and a stomach flu, so I'm trying to get through this day, <laughs> but still can't wait to perform. So I flew myself to Los Angeles to see my doctor. He's like, yeah, you have a stomach virus. You're not supposed to be doing any strenuous dancing or anything for two weeks. Now the next day, I had to be in Houston because MTV was following us for behind the behind the scenes, you know, and all that. We were in Seattle. I'm like, you're gonna have to give me a shot. And he goes, I gotta get on a plane. I have a show. I was drained. I had to sit with an IV for like four hours in my hand. I called Matthew just to let him know what was going on. Uh, I told him, hey, I just got out of the hospital. The doctor said this, whatever. But I'm about to get on a plane. He was like, I don't give a what you just did, you better have your ass in that plane or you're gonna replace. As long as we have Beyonce, there's gonna be a Destiny's Child. But I didn't want to complain because I didn't want to get kicked out of the situation because I've seen what happened to the girls prior, so I'm trying to play my part, go to the hospital on my own, take care of my own stuff, and be back. A similar thing happened when Latavia was sick and in the hospital. Matthew tried to have her replaced by the group's choreographer for their European tour, yet DC would end up carrying on without her returning home on December 13th, 1999. Farrah became a Destiny's Child member on February 13th, 2000. But on July 13th of 2000, the sickness that she was battling had her too ill to participate in Destiny's Child's radio interview. Farrah has a stomach virus. Are you serious? Yeah, she she's at the hotel. Do you want to say something? Is she listening? Do you think she's got the radio on? We hope that she feels better and God bless her. Hey. Many fans who watched the All Access special noted how distant and standoffish Farrah was. But in her defense, when your stomach get to hurting and you got the flu, you don't feel like doing nothing. However, management was over Farrah and they didn't believe she was truly sick. They pulled her into a room where they went on a tirade and berated her calling her everything but a child of God. Like I was losing my identity and I was not being treated as you would personally want someone treating your daughter if the tables were switched around and um, I just couldn't, you know, handle the situation anymore. Which caused her to storm out and abruptly quit the group. Everybody just started ganging up on me. Everybody has something to say. And then so I walked out of the room. I'm like, I'm not about to let oh, you guys just jump on me and gang up on me. This is ridiculous. Now, they thought Farrah was calling bluffs or simply talking out of anger but she literally went back to her hotel room, packed her things, and flew home. Now, after three days and allowing Farrah to cool off, 
Rather than address her personally, Matthew had Michelle, who was the closest person to Farah, call her. Michelle called me three days later from the airport talking about, hey, are you coming to Australia? Huh? I'm not a part of the group anymore, so I'm not going to Australia. She was like, just come, please, just come. She's like, we only have to finish this album and then, you know, we can do our own thing, just please. Michelle handed um, Beyonce the phone and she was like, hey, are you gonna come? And that's when I told her, you know I live 45 minutes away from the airport, so even if I wanted to come, that's not gonna happen. Like, I'm like, why are you, nobody called me? And then she just gave Michelle the phone back. So I didn't feel like I was wanted. I know when I'm not wanted somewhere. Embarrassed to be losing a member yet again, the management team decided to get ahead of the story. And the same way Matthew ran to Sony Music saying, hey, LaToya and Latavia were skipping out on shows, would be the same way that they would have Destiny's Child go on TRL and announce that Farah had been skipping out on performances and on the fans. All of the bad seeds are now out of Destiny's Child. That's We've right. had changes in the group and we finally found the recipe that is perfect. Even though Farah's story of departure has never changed, she maintains that she was in the group for a whole year. That's what she told Wendy Williams in 2005 and that's what she reiterated in her more recent interviews. However, the contract agreement was signed on February 13th of 2000 and the letter of termination was signed August 10th of 2000. So it's unclear how she was in the group for a year, unless she's referring to her being in the Bills 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 video released on June 13th of 1999, which would be 13 months prior to the day she stormed off and quit, thus making it a year. However, working as an extra in a music video and being in the group are two very different things, even if you were on the payroll. Though many people felt she should have stayed longer, toughed it out, or at least got her face on a cover of an album, she felt her sanity and happiness was what was most important. She revealed in an interview with This Is 50 that on a good month, she was bringing home 50k. But she stressed just how much of it would be spent on therapy, trying to undo years of stress and strife had she stayed and continued with the group. Sadly, Farah's life would bring about many trials and tragedies with or without Destiny's Child. For starters, she and the other former members were blacklisted from getting off the ground in the years following Destiny's Child. Latoya and Latavia formed their own quartet, which would endure its own set of lineup changes. However, their production company collapsed and they went separate ways. When Latoya finally did get a solo deal, she put out two promo singles and rumors swirled that Matthew was paying Houston radio stations to play Beyonce's check on it single instead. Though there is no legitimate evidence to support this, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the case. Latoya would eventually go on to have her own rise to fame. Farah would go on to appear in a few music videos from other artists before being signed to Full Real Entertainment, a record label founded by Nelly, and would record a few songs like Get At Me featuring Method Man before being dropped and then signing with Street Family, which was Fabulous's label, where she would collaborate with him on the song More Than A Pretty Face and would record a few songs such as Extraordinary Love and Hurry Please, the latter of which is probably her best song. Though Farah had the look and could dance, it was evident that she hadn't taken the proper time to learn and mature her voice. In many of her solo songs, she relied heavily on her background vocalist to kind of bring it all together. She would eventually be dropped from the label in 2005, causing many to question her singing ability. And Wendy Williams was spearheading the quest to find out the truth. She had Farrah appear on her radio show to ask her about Destiny's Child and to have her sing. You don't know the pain that I feel. What song is this? You're taking my love for granted and you just want to see it your way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, but you Trimble. want to know what? That's still workable. She sounded good to you? Yeah. Thank you. Tone deaf and blind. <laughs> I see what he is. <laughs> it, it, listen, it's not the best voice. It is interesting to note that former member Latavia would undergo the same criticisms years later when she appeared on R&B Divas and refused to sing. Once again, Wendy was determined to get to the truth. This led many people to speculate that Latavia and Farah were nothing more than studio singers. 
people who sounded decent on the record but had very little live singing ability without a harmony blend. Latavia sang lead on two songs while in Destiny's Child. One was a cover of Jody Watley's 16, which Destiny's Child renamed Sweet 16, and another song called Can't Help Myself. She also sang lead on a few songs for the group Angel, but by the time she appeared on R&B Divas, she hadn't sung in years, as it was too emotional for her to attempt after two failed groups. But I know what she and Farrah are capable of, and I'm certain if they had kept at their vocal training and perfecting their craft, they would eventually master their skills. But in the meantime, between time, Farrah would return to acting. Now prior to Destiny's Child, she had appeared in the film Trippin' and as a Jane Doe in Girl Interrupted, and would appear in movies like The Brewster Project, Eyes of Darkness, and Unemployed. Hi. Hello. You guys are here for a job, right? Duh, this is the unemployment office, isn't it? Don't get smart with me. I throw smart asses like you in the trash. Now what type of job are you here for? Uh, well, personally, I, I am looking for a job how much do you charge yo man cool. oh, i'm sorry that was, that was a good one was... <laughs> don't make me call my man ray ray up here he just got out of jail 20 minutes ago and i can have him here in five whoa what? we do not want to meet hey, ray ray okay we don't want to be beaten by ray ray i will call my man I, i'm don't. sure he's a tough guy oh he's okay. real tough i have Double three this. jobs yes. available three jobs Great. the highest paying one. job is the blue oyster bar on santa monica uh all you need is Blue biker shorts and seven seventy five an hour. Oh, you know I'm, I'm trying to come Negro. to work. I'm trying to help you guys out. What's the last? Ghetto one? is not a bad thing. Ghetto is work, Ghetto. which you guys don't have right now. She would also produce her own horror film called Single Black Female, in which she starred as Karma, the main character. She was very proud of this film, but after the flick was released to unpleasant reviews, she decided to return to music and would form yet another girl group called Phoenix which featured members Bethany Grant and Queen. They had a pretty moderate following on MySpace after releasing their song Post Boy, which garnered 1,300 plays on their MySpace page. Making a little buzz, little buzz buzz. They would also release another song called Sharp Shooter, but everything fell apart for the group when it was discovered that Bethany was involved in adult filmography on the side, which caused her to be dismissed from the group. Yet. She was the lead singer, so with no one to replace Bethany, the group fell apart. If Farrah had nothing else, though, she definitely had her looks, and modeled for Russell Simmons fashion line, Def Jam University, and was featured in Teen People, Ebony, Cosmo Girl, Today's Black Woman, and even Vibe magazines. But yet another series of unfortunate events would be just over the horizon for Farrah. On April 25th, 2011, she would be arrested for disorderly conduct. It was reported that alcohol was involved in the incident, but Farrah would claim to have been manhandled by the police. She said in the statement, Unfortunately, I am the latest victim on what seems to be a growing list of those who are racially profiled and mistreated by Culver City Police. She would be released hours later on a $100 bail. Soon after this incident, and after Farrah had fallen behind on storage payments, her storage unit went up for auction and a man bought everything in it and started auctioning off her personal memorabilia on eBay, including 13 rolls of film taken when she was in Destiny's Child, group photos, personal pics of each Destiny's Child member that hadn't been seen by the public, pics taken with other artists like Jay-Z, Diana Ross, and Enrique Iglesias, gifts and cards that she had received from Michelle for her birthday, all of her VIP passes and award show tickets, a key she received to the city of Houston, and even some legal documents, such as her signed management agreement with Matthew, which was signed by all four members of Destiny's Child, and and the aforementioned letter of termination as well. This whole ordeal was embarrassing and even unethical in my opinion. It was probably difficult for Farrah to have these things displayed in front of her. She probably didn't want to be reminded of the world she walked away from and may not have been ready to go through the memorabilia to fully process what all she had experienced. Sure, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to sift through footage and physically hold items representing a controversial time in your past. But we, 
as humans and non-celebrities sitting on the outside looking in are quick to consume a celeb's worldly possessions with a passion just to say we have something of theirs. Though this was sad, things would only get worse when the following year, her cousin, Natina Reed, was struck and killed by a vehicle while attempting to cross the road. She and Farah were months apart in age and were very close as they were both in the music industry at the same time. Natina was the rapper in a popular 90s R&B group called Black, who were founded by Left Eye, and the group just so happened to be former label mates with Destiny's Child, but the great Matthew Knowles would take over and purchase all of the group's masters, and they were dropped from the label shortly thereafter, which is another story that I will detail in another documentary. But devastated at her cousin's death, she would pay a lovely tribute online but offline, she would self-soothe, similar to how Latavia used substances and alcohol to self-soothe following the endless amount of suffering that she dealt with after Destiny's Child, which she detailed in her book and plans to release in her upcoming documentary. Y'all be on the lookout for that. Sadly, Farrah's abuse of these vices took a toll as she continued to plummet further and further downhill. She would be arrested three more times for disorderly conduct, possession of substances, and public intoxication after she was found at 5 a.m. sleeping in the front yard of a stranger's house. In the last instance, she got into an argument with a male friend around 3 a.m. Thursday outside a gym in DeKalb County, Georgia. When the officer showed up, she said she wasn't ready to go home and added that these dudes won't leave me alone. They asked how much she had been drinking and she fired back, not enough. After her release the next day, she would go on to write, unbothered and staying prayed up and away from any negativity, still standing and I'm God's child. Don't judge what you don't know. The sad thing is people live for the drama, but run from the truth. There's always three sides to a story, your side, my side, and the truth. Farrah's legacy was tainted by 2016 mostly due to her own negligent actions and her inability to rise above the chaos and become triumphant and successful the way that LaToya did. She never maintained a good profile. During an episode of Millionaire Matchmaker, she was confronted by the host for showing up four hours late to her date. She built up the reputation for being the pretty girl who just didn't care because her looks got her anywhere. Hell, it got her into one of the biggest girl groups ever in the world. And I've been the biggest one and you're still together. I know, but you weren't in it. I was in it. I sold 19 million albums on Say My Name. I know, but did you? Did I what? Ask? Did I sell 19 million albums? Did you? Absolutely, I sing. <laughs> say my name, say my name. <laughs> did you sell the records? Though? Honey, ask how many records they sold after I left individually and as a group if they sold that many since Say My Name, the biggest selling record of Destiny's Child. This clip was from a viral pilot that would get picked up years later and turned into a reality TV show called Encore that helped revive the careers of former members of girl groups. Sad to say, Farrah would not appear on the show at all. The viewers perceived this as a lack of commitment on Farrah's part, as it was her clip that caused the show to be picked up by BET in the first place. What folks didn't know is, the pilot was filmed anywhere between 2013 and 2015, but was not picked up till around 2019-2020. At most, that is a seven year difference, so Farrah could have had a myriad of reasons as to why she couldn't participate, which was fair enough. But her being featured in an embarrassing clip and not appearing on the show to redeem herself only worsened her public image. I remember Farrah Franklin claimed that she wasn't, she didn't quit the show, the, the group. She said that she quit the group herself and then, okay, <laughs> because we she was talking about Hello? Shit. We're not going there. <laughs> All of the other members refused to acknowledge Farrah. She was absent from reunions. And when Beyonce thanked everyone in Destiny's Child at the 2011 Billboard Awards, she went down the row and named every member except Farrah. Because as the fans put it, Farrah was a non-factor, someone whose looks got her in the group, but whose lack of talent and drive got her removed, only to have little to no success elsewhere. Fans often campaign for a Destiny's Child reunion, but with every member being present except Farrah, because according to them, no one likes her, and she ain't never got her luggage. However, she maintains that she's genuinely happy in her life today. She would release three music videos, Magic and Makeup, which is her most known song, Build Me Up with Lucky Harmon, and Stupid Me, 
which for some reason, these two videos were released many years after they were filmed. Again, showing a lack of commitment and seriousness to her artistry. Had they been released at their respective filming times, they might have done something. I will say that in putting together this documentary, I noticed a pattern of whenever Farrah would get good and ready to do something, unforeseen circumstances always seemed to find her. I know that what I do for a living is not my purpose, so I'm still finding myself along the way. As a young girl, I wanted attention from my mother. I kind of came second to whoever she was dating at the time. I had never actually met my biological father. Obviously, I would want to know who it is and look him in his face. There are certain things that I would like to know and just who my family members are in general, too, and just to know what he looks like. For years, she sought to connect with her father. Sadly, in 2017, she would learn that he passed away before having that moment to connect with her. She wrote, Feeling really down right now. I just found out that my biological father, Rodney Allen Hurd, passed away. Honestly, I don't know how I should feel right now. I never got the chance to see or meet him. Only Facebook likes and comments. And now I'll never get that chance. I have so many unanswered questions that only he could answer. And y'all, I don't know that kind of pain and I don't wish to know that kind of pain. I cannot fathom how she got through that, if she ever did. She recently appeared with longtime friend Tariq Nasheed on his live. And when she was on there, she was somewhat drunken and incoherent at times, again, hurting her public image. This woman has been through a lot, and I know a lot of people don't like her, but I tell y'all what though, there is something about Farrah that with every negative hand that she's been dealt, she's also given an equal opportunity to grow through it and not just go through it. Yeah, yeah, right now, um, we need somebody to come to the stage. And her name is Pharaoh Franklin. Come on to the stage. Why y'all clapping? Why y'all clapping? Pharaoh Franklin coming to the stage. Why y'all clapping? Come on. Now, let's clap for Pharaoh Franklin's boots. Yeah, she, she represented very well. Very I'm a, well. I'm on spoken tongue when I saw these boots. What they make say? Yeah. Eee, Shandala. All right, now. She may have lost her key to the city of Houston in the 2011 auction, but the mayor of Houston, Sylvester Turner, would declare August 23rd, 2022, the city of Houston's Farrah Franklin Day. And the blessings kept pouring in when she was honored with the Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award in Houston in December of last year. All I can say is, to Miss Farrah, I see you. Keep doing your thing, stay humble, stay blessed. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like. Y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. I'll catch y'all on the next one.